Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen this rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of God for the people of God. The Lord be with us this morning as we come to this holy time of year. And we remember the quest of the wise men. And we have a look at why... They came to cast their eyes on the baby Jesus. We thank you for the spirit of giving that exists in this congregation. And we pray that in the year to come, you will continue to bless us as you teach us your lessons of generosity. In Christ we pray. Amen. Epiphany Sunday. The Sunday closest to January 6th, the time that we remember the visit of the Magi, the wise men, to the Christ child. The word epiphany, by way of reminder, is an aha. It's something that's been in front of you for a long time, but maybe you haven't recognized it. Maybe you've not realized it, and now suddenly you take it in with greater clarity and greater understanding. And so I hope that uh, as we look briefly this morning at the gifts of the Magi, that we'll have an epiphany of sorts together. On Christmas Eve, we gathered here and we heard the words of Luke's gospel and how the shepherds were beckoned by the angels to come and to, to worship the Christ child. And we remembered that the social ladder on which uh, the, the shepherds stood was the lowest rung of that ladder. And now, by contrast, in Matthew's Gospel, we see a different group of seekers, a different group of pilgrims this morning, the wise men. And it's a great contrast between the shepherds who had no status and the wise men who were learned astrologers who have come to seek Jesus and to pay him homage. I tried to think what this would be like in our own day and age. How often is it that everyone celebrates the birth of a child? It doesn't happen with great regularity. But it did happen this past July, didn't it? It did happen when George Alexander Louis Louis of Cambridge was born to uh, Prince William and to Kate Middleton. Because much of the English populace uh, joined in the celebration of that birth and and certainly world leaders did what's expected in occasions like that and they offered the appropriate gifts as uh, uh, heads of state to the newborn prince. And our talk shows here in the United States which have broad appeal made much of this birth and, and so I wondered what kind of gifts did people bring to this child so I began to research it a little bit and there were thousands of teddy bears that were left at the palace gates in honoring this child. That was a a hugely numerical gift. There was also a $15,000 bracelet that was commissioned by uh, jeweler Theo Fennel uh, for Kate 
and for the baby, which had a, uh, a built-in diaper cream holder for the person who has everything. You now have a bracelet in which you can put diaper cream. It was kind of an ugly bracelet, to be truthful, but it was commissioned uh, for Kate. The Finnish government did what the, the Finnish government does. Um, in Finland, if you are the parent of a newborn, you get a cardboard box issued by the government that has things that you need for your first child, including booties and uh, a child's snowsuit, because I guess it snows a lot in Finland, and a teething ring and other necessities of first-time parents that they may not have thought of getting. And then when you're done with the box, you can take it and turn it over and put tab A in slot B and fold it exactly right, and it becomes a government issue crib made out of cardboard for a newborn. I have a feeling that the English royalty did not utilize that particular <laughs> gift, but that's just a hunch. So when a child is born or when some big event happens in our lives, we give gifts. And why do we give gifts? We give gifts because it's a symbol of our love and our caring. Our means may be limited, but if we give good gifts, we think a lot about those gifts. And I have a feeling that the wise men thought a lot about the gifts that they gave. Tradition holds, I don't know that scripture supports it necessarily, but tradition holds that there were three wise men, Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar were their names, traditionally. And tradition also holds that they talked a lot among themselves about what were the right three gifts to bring to the infant Jesus. And I want us to look real quickly at those. Myrrh. We'll start at the back. Myrrh. Myrrh is not something we're particularly familiar with today, but at the time of Jesus' birth, it would have been one of the most expensive, most precious compounds known to humankind. It was harvested from a rare tree. It's a gummy resin and... Uh, when it dries, it looks like little amber-colored rocks. A pound of myrrh in those days would have been valued at somewhere between four and $5,000 a pound. It was believed to have curative properties. It was believed it could prolong life. But when it didn't, it had another use. It was used to embalm people, royalty particularly. It's rumored that when archaeologists opened King Tut's tomb in 1922 that the smell of myrrh was so overwhelming that they were literally knocked backwards because there was so much myrrh used in that embalming process. And we know that it was myrrh mixed with rancid wine that was given Jesus during the crucifixion. Myrrh had many uses in those days, but over time it became associated with death. And tradition tells us that the gift of myrrh symbolized Jesus' death and his giving of himself for us. And then there was frankincense. Frankincense, too, came from the resin of a tree. But in the time of Christ, frankincense would have cost roughly a tenth of the cost of myrrh. It was poor man's myrrh. And it does seem, and it did seem, that it had real value in treating things like asthma and arthritis. It's still around today. It's called a different name. But it's a, 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 an ingredient in a lot of medical products even today. But frankincense was often burned in the temples to symbolize the prayers of the people rising to heaven. And frankincense became associated with the priestly function. And frankincense was given as a gift to the baby Jesus to symbolize that he would be the priest of all. And then there was gold. And that's the one we're most familiar with today. Gold has always symbolized wealth. It's a pure substance. It's long had usage in medicine. It was used for dental fillings by the Etruscans. It conducts electricity. It doesn't tarnish. It can be hammered into thin sheets. It's pliable. In ancient times, it was believed to have supernatural healing abilities. And it's said that when the Spanish explorers first came to South America, they couldn't communicate. Their language was far too different. They were separated 
by a vast ocean of culture and other things, but they agreed on one thing, that gold could be used as a common means of exchange. Gold has always symbolized wealth and kingship. And so tradition has told us that gold was given by the wise men to symbolize the kingship of Christ. As I, I looked again at these gifts and what they mean, I, I struggled, well, what's so new about that? These were costly things. These were symbolic things. But what is the deal? And then it hit me. I had a little bit of an epiphany. All of these gifts in Jesus' time were used for healing and wholeness. And they were gifts that when given to an individual, or in this case the Holy Family, were a great blessing because they could be used for healing. And so it's a bit ironic that healing gifts were brought to the one who would heal the infirmities of humankind, Jesus. It's rich, isn't it? <laughs> if you allow yourself to really take it in. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. And then they opened their treasure chest, offering him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So how do we apply the lesson of the wise men to our lives? I don't think I have to preach to you about that, to be honest. Because, to be honest, I, my heart has been overtaken this past couple of weeks. Because as a pastor, you get to witness, one of the perks of being a pastor, other than attending um, really neat committee meetings on Monday and Tuesday nights. <laughs> but one of the great perks of being a pastor is that you get to witness how God is at work in people's lives. And I can't begin to tell you, words fail me this morning, how that has overtaken me and how I have watched as these healing substances used in the transformation of lives are still being given. How people are still coming and still kneeling and still opening their chests. And they're still giving gifts of great value that have the power to heal in body and in spirit. Sometimes scripture really just jumps off the page and lives. And this to me is one of those times. And I hope you'll just go with me for a moment and I hope you will, you will visualize these wise men kneeling and paying tribute and reverence to this king and opening their chests and that you'll just stop for a moment and you'll praise God and you'll abide there with me because to me this has been a holy time. And the stories of generosity that have occurred in the last two weeks exceed just about any I've ever known. And don't, please do not hear me saying this is about something as mundane as making the church budget. I don't want anyone to go away with that idea. It is how you have brought the best that you have to Jesus. And you've demonstrated that the church can still offer healing and transformative gifts in the name of Jesus. That we can still impart hope to others who need hope. That we can give gifts of life as we worship Christ. Let me tell you about a young girl, six years old, 
who in the first awakening service last Sunday heard me say, Oh, folks, let me have your attention here. There's only two days left in the year. And she went home. And she talked with her parents and she said, I want to do something to help the church. And the parents are deeply committed disciples themselves, so they talked with her and they spent the time and they counseled with her. And finally she ended up writing a $30 check, which for her represented the sum total of the, the amount of birthday money she'd just been given for her birthday. She gave it to Christ church. Can you imagine? Six years old. I can almost hear the hinges on that chest opening up. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Then I think of a generous man from a faithful family who's been devoted to this church for years and, and decided that there's no better way to honor his parents' memory than to give a check equal to the life savings of the average retired person and to say with that check, here, do something that will help people and will honor God and will honor the memory of my mother and father. That's what they would have wanted. That's what I believe God wants us to do with our resources. And I see wise men kneeling and paying him homage. And then I think of your generosity on Christmas Eve as you helped families in need in the year to come. And, and we said that we're going to be sending people to Haiti on a mission trip. And, and just like that, you give $8,000. And then I think of the people that steadfastly and consistently have given to support the church. And, and I praise God for, for their gifts. And then I think of those that volunteer without grumbling. And then I think of those who pray. And they're all bringing their gifts. And then a friend, after the Christmas Eve service, sat out and wrote a note. And he said, I praise God that this church is alive. Don't you just want to stay here a little while? I do. But we need to get on. We've got work to do. These gifts are high in value. They're symbolic things, but they have one thing in common. They are for healing. And in the year to come, they will heal broken spirits. They will feed hungry stomachs. They will ease confused minds. They will transform lives. And this Christmas, you, the church, have given a gift of an epiphany. At least I'm understanding God's goodness in a way I never really have before. And I thank God for you and for your generosity. And you've taken me to that place where the wise men have knelt down. And my prayer is that as we come this morning to receive this bread and cup, that it'll be a time of celebration. That it'll be almost a foretaste of heaven as we come to this table. And that we may leave this place with glad hearts, sharing gifts of healing everywhere we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit. Amen. I want to invite you to join with me in this wonderful covenant prayer of the Wesleyan tradition as we now look to a new year. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be in. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. 
I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified.